Brown. Um, in light of that, so like, you know, Hadith scholarship has been around for what several hundred years, and I'm gonna ask kind of a loaded question about a certain personality. So, um, it's it's at your discretion if you want to answer or not. My background, not right now, but in the past, in my younger years, I was pretty active in the Salafi Dawa, or what we call Dawa the Salafiyah, um, if you want to be a little bit more formal about it. And one of the main personalities that, uh, we, you know, these brothers or sisters are, you know, in this movement are attached to is Sheikh uh, Muhammad Nasruddin al Albani, Rahimahullah. And he's very polarizing because a lot of people who are traditionalists will say, well, he'd have a teacher, etc. And, you know, and sometimes, and after leaving that whole ideology, you know, you kind of understand that, like, well, there's a lot of, like, hype and slogans and stuff thrown around around certain scholars. Um, w- w- what's the, you know, I don't know if you, like, if you've studied him at in any depth, but w- w- what's your, basically, your, your take on him? W- what's his methodology? And, like, how can someone in the 20th century come across and say, well, this is Sahih, this is Hassan? Like, hasn't this already been done? Or was he getting access to mm-hmm. new... uh you know, books of hadith that, or other, you know, texts that people weren't necessarily coming across. So, it, with the case of Sheikh Al Albani or Himahullah, there's a couple of things one has to keep in mind, which is that there's a lot about people that causes conflict that's not just their ideas. Um, I think he had a he had a very kind of caustic, combative personality. I think if he had if he had said things in a different way, if he had, you know, expressed himself in a different way, probably he would have had less conflicts with people. So I think some of it is, is his personality. Um, and, uh, and then second, I think the, you know, most of the real controversies about him are not about his Hadith scholarship. It's about his legal rulings, you know, that, uh, um, let's say women are not allowed to wear gold rings, um, and not just men that, um, uh, uh, recovering the face is not required and things like that. I mean, so he, he, it was, I think his legal rulings and then his, you know, his, his rulings on theological issues like, uh, Tawassal, visitation of graves, um, intermediation by saints and things. And these are the same things that, you know, Salafis and non-Salafis are argue, always arguing about. So I think part of it is just sort of this thing Salafis, Salafis not argue about regarding theology. Some of Albani's particular legal rulings, um, you know, the fact that he didn't constrain himself to any madhab. So uh, I think the majority of things that are controversial about Albani actually have to do with those those issues. I, I don't – his Hadith scholarship is – you know, I've never seen anything from Al-Albani that really differs from any other – you know, from the, the sort of range of normal methodology of other – Sunni Hadith scholars from the 700s to the 20th century, right? I mean, he's he doesn't he's not like he has some methodology for for authenticating or declaring weak hadiths that other people don't have. And if you know, people might disagree with his opinion on something, but they might also disagree with Ibn Haban or uh, you know Abdul you know Aduri or Dawraqi or Al Munduri or someone. I mean, there's all sorts of you know this constant disagreement amongst Sunni scholars on these topic on particulars of hadith um, hadith judgment. So that's not a unusual. Third of all, I mean, I think that his you know, his book, he did tremendous khidma, he did tremendous service to the study of hadith. I mean, if you, if you just want to, if you just come across any hadith and you say, I want to know if this is authentic or not, uh, you know, it's not like every hadith out there has rulings on it. Um, it's actually really hard to, it takes a lot of work to go through an entire book and rate every hadith. And very few Muslim scholars ever did that. Um, and so, you know, if you find a hadith in Mu'jam of a Tabrani or in the Jam of a Tirmidhi or something like that, and you better pray that somebody somewhere gave a ruling on that hadith's reliability. Otherwise, it's no, there's no guarantee you're going to find that information. Well, Albani actually did. He actually went through a huge number of books and gave for every single hadith his opinion. And he backed it up with evidence. And that was a sub- substantive, a real important contribution. And one of the reasons people always cite Albani isn't because he's some kind of, 
you know, they're, 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 he's some kind of superstar and Hadith, you know, whose opinion matters more than anyone else. He might be the only person who ever offered an opinion on that Hadith. And that's an incredibly valuable service. Yeah, he was a game changer uh, for sure. Yeah, um, and then if you look at his, you know, if you look at his discussions of, uh, you know, why he considers Hadith to be weak or, or, or strong, you know, he lays out his reasoning, and you can disagree with his reasoning if you're qualified. Um, and that's, you know, but that would be no different than if you were looking at the Dhabi or Ibn Taymiyyah or Ibn Hajj al Asqalani. You would have probably the same kind of disagreements because this stuff, a lot of it is 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 based on judgment calls and weighing evidence. So that it's not kind of doing math math problems. It's it's a art, not a science. Well, and that's really uh, eye opening. I actually didn't know because the question in my head was, and I, you're always afraid to ask it to other because you're, you know, <laughs> you know, fearful of being ostracized from the uh, from, from the gang. Um, but like, because I, I was like, well, hasn't this work already been done? And then no, uh, yeah, uh, you know, and, and you explained it. What no, it hasn't been done. But also, let me let me let me also, you know, something you asked is important that I address, which is. The science of Hadith study never ends. And this was a debate that I actually talked about this in my first book, uh, The Canonization of Bukhari and Muslim. And I think I mentioned it in my in my book on Hadith as well. But, you know, there was a big debate that starts in the 1200s over a basically a misunderstanding of something that one scholar writes. And uh, but the debate is basically has has the process of, you know, authenticating or uh, de-authenticating hadiths has that ended uh and basically everybody who mattered said no it hasn't ended because as famous scholar of cairo zayn al-din al-iraqi said this is the job of hadith, hadith scholars it never ends now if there's something in bukhari that bukhari thinks is sahih then unless it's a very rare exception probably no one else is going to say it's not sahih i mean just just not because they're afraid of disagreement with Bukhari, but just because, um, statistically speaking, if he he's very very selective, and so if you know if if, if he says something's authentic, probably other people also said that um, as well. And it, you know the, the books and the, the hadiths in Bukhari and Muslim are a very small number of hadiths. We're talking about you know anywhere from two thousand, you know basically let's say five or six thousand, maybe seven eight thousand, depending on how you count what hadith is versus different narrations of the same tradition. But you're talking about a relatively small number of hadiths compared to the massive number of reports that are compiled in the, are found in all the different books of hadith uh, compiled in Islamic civilization. So, you know, what they're talking about is what about all those other hadiths out there? I mean, look at, let's say Ibn Majah's Sunan. What Ibn Majah's Sunan is not a Sahih book. So when you want to know if a hadith is reliable and that someone has to go and do that work and, it's, it's not like someone a year after Ibn Majah died decided to do that for his book. The first book that was a, even a commentary on Ibn Majah's Sunan wasn't written until the 1300s. So people were constantly and still remain uh, in the process of uh, looking at hadiths that are found in different books, trying to authenticate and trying to figure out what their status is. And because, again, this is a, a process that is uh, inevitably – uh, subject to disagreement, people will also be evaluating the work of others. 